You're live. Annika? Yep. Um, good evening. I will now call to order the uh, Park County School Board um, June 2015 2020 resolution. Um, any questions about tonight's agenda? Any questions about tonight's consent agenda? I would move to accept it as presented. Is there a second? Second. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. All opposed? Superintendent and staff reports, the Finance Committee, committee report. Shorter than normal. 
there hasn't been a lot of expenditures going on. Um, Mayana, two points of clarification. Yeah. <coughs> to add to what Brenda said. So the $2.35 million fund balance is all funds. Food service, capital, operating, et cetera. Uh, approximately 1.2 of that is operating. So the division will not have a $2.35 million operating fund balance. Uh, it's approximately half that. And then secondly, two separate pots of CARES Act funding money. The school division will receive $148,000. Mr. Boyce, our county administrator, sent a, an email to all department heads asking for input on how the county might, uh, might use its funds uh, that will be received. And, and there's certain set asides for the county area bills, the county boards, uh, but uh, that's the list that, that you see in your packet are the items that. Uh, on behalf of the school division, that I ask for consideration on. So, just two points of just to clarify the further report. Um, okay, any questions? Dr. Bishop, could you talk a little bit about um, food services and um, what this looks like with not receiving? Um, meal revenue for the past three months? Yes. So, so meal revenue, um, we've shifted pots of money, basically. Um, the, the school division has served 43,300 and some odd meals. Uh, half of those are breakfast at a reimbursable rate of 216 per meal. Uh, the lunch reimbursement, the other half is at 376 per meal. So that's approximately $13,000 per week. Times four, $52,000. Our typical revenue in a month is approximately $94,000. So it's uh, about half the revenue. Um, once this cycle of pay goes forward and we're finished paying food service workers, uh, the revenues and the expenses will catch up with one another. Uh, we will have a deficit in food service this year as a result of the pandemic. Um, but we serve 43000 some of the to uh, the families in Clark County. Yeah, nothing is covered. Yeah. Any additional questions? No? Thank you. Thank you. Welcome, board. Okay. Um, okay, superintendent's update. Okay. Just a few updates for me. Some workplace learning statistics through March 13th. We had 260 students who participated in the workplace learning experience, uh, some more than one. Uh, so, for a total uh, number of experiences of 340, we started to log those in Tower School and did a much better job of tracking them. Uh, so, even students who, uh, who wanted to test drive a career or wanted to do a visit uh, to, to a business have had an opportunity to do that. Uh, so 260 students, 340 different experiences. Some of those are group experiences, going to the Winchester Medals and things like that. Allowed them stairs is a, is a field trip we often take. Uh, so much better numbers and much better tracking than we've had in the past. Uh, we did conduct a teacher and parent survey related to remote learning. 119 teachers and 463 parents responded to a series of questions and those results are attached. Uh, I provided you, although it was small, I think that you could probably blow it up in a PDF document. Uh, just kind of a summary of responses. And as I read through all of these, one of the things that I figured, what I figured out was it was from a person's perspective and their experience and their expectation. Uh, so on one line, you might read remote learning went really well for my students. And on another line, you might read we hated it. Uh, <laughs> by and large, People didn't like it. So let's take a, a quick look at the parent survey and just kind of a summary. Uh, I grabbed the, the big items uh, and recorded them out here. 57% of our families or participants said they were elementary school parents. Some of these folks could have been kind of once you were asked to indicate if you were more than one level. 
38% middle school, 39% high school. Communication, the negative on our communication was lack, lack of consistency in posting assignments. Uh, a desire for weekly updates from teachers, school, and central office administrators. Uh, the lack of clarity with posting assignments and the desire for more correct, direct communication with teachers. There were many, many positive comments about communication, though, from all levels. Um, again, it was a person's experience or individual experience or expectation. So, the amount of time students spend on assignments per day, one to two hours, 30%, two to three hours, 29%, three to four hours, 18%, and more than four hours, 11%. So parents were then asked to rate their satisfaction with the amount of work. Uh, there was a, a scale of one to four. So three and four were the higher marks. 65% of the amount of work was uh, manageable. Time to complete assignments, 81% of the people liked the fact that they had time to complete. Uh, feedback from teachers uh, was a little lower, 54%. Distribution of materials, 59%, availability of teachers, 52%, and assistance with technology uh, received a fairly high mark of 65%. Some of the technology issues we all know people have internet access, they didn't have a device, uh, they lost a charger, uh, a variety of things uh, that, uh, that we know exist and we need to try to come to some resolution on how to deal with those in the future. So, what were the challenges that parents faced? Balancing work and school. Uh, keeping their student motivated or focused, uh, internet issues, and then the structure of the plan, inconsistency, lack of video. We had a conversation about that some uh, month or so ago. The positives, people enjoyed bonding with their child over their schoolwork. There were some videos and teacher feedback. We did have some, um, like IB teachers were required to do some video work with their students. Uh, it was self-paced and flexible. Uh, there were uh, positive comments about teachers. There were less distractions. And then suggestions for improvement, adding video, internet uh, devices for students, consistency and feedback. And then there were some folks who said, you know, we'd like to have some materials. We'd like to have some textbooks. We'd like to have some workbooks available to help our students. And then more interactive lessons. So it wasn't uh, worksheet driven, uh, that kind of thing. On the teacher side, 119 responses, 50 elementary, 30% middle, and 40% high school. Communication positives from central office, uh, the email updates uh, from students and parents, school meetings. There were a lot of virtual meetings, virtual faculty meetings, virtual planning meetings, grade level meetings at the elementary school, specialists were meeting virtually. Um, all of our schools were engaged. We were meeting virtually with administrators. Uh, I participated in some virtual meetings at, at school levels. Uh, and then the technology uh, was a positive, and then the, the documents were easy to follow. Uh, the negatives, parent responses to emails and phone calls, lack of communication with students virtually, a desire for more virtual meetings with school personnel, uh, more information about next year and frequency of communication. Um, you know, we found out last Tuesday what the state plan was moving forward. Uh, so this was actually due the Friday before that, the survey was. Um, level of satisfaction from our teachers. With student work, 60% uh, were pleased with ranked at three or four. Uh, student engagement needed improvement. Uh, Google Classroom, vast majority thought it was reasonable with the learning management system. Assistance with technology, vast majority thought it was reasonable. And then uh, this was a bar graph. So uh, one of the, the uh, number four was reasonable. Uh, administrators' expectations of teachers in providing learning activities. Eighty-four percent said that we were reasonable in what our expectations were, considering the circumstances. Challenges were student participation, a more guidance from administrators and time to implement. Uh, desired more live meetings, lack of video, difficult to incorporate interactive activities, tough to balance work at home, uh, lack of internet. Even with some of our teachers, uh, I know of several teachers who were uh, having to go different places to, to get internet access. And some difficulty in getting technology to work. And then there were some positives, uh, those communications with students uh, required to get out of their comfort zone as a teacher, 
uh, had a conversation with a teacher just yesterday who said that uh, disclosure forced her to use technology more than she would have in her kindergarten classroom. Uh, then they learning technology, not just using it, but learning how to do it. Student engagement was a positive, parent feedback was a positive, and, and the collaboration with colleagues uh, were all positive items. Uh, so again, I think a lot of it is obviously perspective and what the expectations were um, kind of across the board. Um, Virginia Board of Nursing, any questions about the survey? Let me stop there for a second. There was the question on that. If you come back to school, do you know what the in the parents are saying? 81% of the 463 respondents said their children would, I'm sorry, 91% said their children would be coming back to school. Again, small sample size. Um, if we had only 463 respondents, um, that was a 91%. Who said yes? That's a pretty big response. I mean, I think uh, other surveys that we put out have increased that kind of, uh, of feedback. That's for yeah. yeah, our our budget survey is about half that number. Right. A little over two hundred each one. Yeah. I have a question. Sure. Um, first, thank you for putting this together. Um, I thought it was um, it was really good, and I was like John, really pleased to see how many parents responded to it compared to a normal survey. Um, and my question is, do you, do we have a way that we could um, drill down and ask some questions of some specific groups, maybe through um, the Office of Student Services? So um, ask specific groups of English language learners, special education students, um, students of um, low SES, if we could reach out to those families and maybe ask them some targeted questions about um, what we could do to improve their experience. Could we, yes, I just want to give it some thought as to what questions to ask. Uh, to be able to get feedback, that's going to be meaningful. Um, so let me give it some thought. Okay. To answer your question, yes, we can do that. We can send out messages through our student information system that's specifically targeted to a certain group of students. Okay, I think that would be, um, maybe it would be helpful for next, um, for planning for next year to be able to drill down into those groups that um, we're most likely to have challenges with remote learning. Um, so that if we go back to that model at any point during next year, or even you know, on this hybrid model, we're doing it from the start, we could, help them address, you know, anything that is within our control to help with. Thanks. Um, moving on, any other questions about the survey? Um, so there was a lot of value in not just having a survey that would just click a button and kind of rate something. The fact that parents have to put in some actual comments, I think was really helpful. Took a little longer to kind of read through it and, and figure out those big uh, umbrella kinds of things we need to address. Uh, but it was more helpful than just having somebody click a button, like a yes or a no. Uh, the Virginia Board of Nursing has completed its review of the program at Clark County High School and determined that it needs, continues to meet all the state requirements. Uh, just to put a bug in your ear, I would suggest or recommend that you consider a meeting on July 13th. That would be your typical work session meeting in July, although one is not currently scheduled for the purpose of reviewing the uh, purpose of reviewing kind of plans moving forward for next year. So just for consideration uh, of the board. Overall student participation in remote learning activities, I looked at this today, added this, got the feedback from uh, John Nova who put it together. Clark County High School at 87.1%. Over 90% in the ninth grade. Uh, Johnson Williams had an overall participation rate of 91.3%, over 93% in the eighth grade. Cooley at 78.9%, and Boyce was 66.8%. Now, I'll say what I said to you last month when we talked about this. 
we knew the data would be flawed from the beginning because it, it didn't indicate how many kids completed assignments, how many did something, log in and did something during the course of the period of time. So the first period of time was up to our last meeting from you know, the start up to our last meeting and the second period of time from that or from last Friday. So overall, a fairly good participation rate. Uh, there's a variety of reasons why people didn't participate. And that, they had time, had family considerations, had to deal with. Uh, but overall, not bad considering this was the first time uh, we've ever done this and we were forced to do it under unique and difficult circumstances. Any questions for Dr. Bishop? No? Thank you. Um, audience comments? Um, audience comments are limited to three minutes per person. Um, anyone wishing to speak should fill out a speaker's card and present it to the um, clerk. And then I know we have some questions that came through email or comments through email. Is that right? Sure. I have two signed up. Okay, yeah, perfect. I'm going to start here. So Gordon said that I'm part of here since I gave my mic up for that. Oh, okay. So then. When we get to the meat of this discussion tonight, I'll go up or I'll pull the mic back. All right. Oh, the first speaker is Tracy Smith. Hello. Um, I wanted to take an opportunity to reflect a little bit on the graduation experience this year, which we all know was trying and um, difficult and unfortunate. But um, having looked at what all the other schools did in the area and having experienced um, three Clark County graduations, the third was this year, I can't say enough good things about how hard Dana and Dr. Bishop and all the faculty and staff worked to make it an outstanding event. It was clearly communicated. It was really well run. Um, it was great to see happy faces, teachers, so many of them there to wish the kids well. The photographers did an excellent job. The photographs that we were sent were timely. They're beautiful. The kids really just had um, an uplifting experience. It was really pr pretty terrific. So thank you to Dr. Bishop and Dana and anybody who put their effort into this. It was really um Far and above what we expected to happen for our kids. It was nice. Thank you. Carrie McKenna. Good evening. I'm the mother of two children enrolled in Clark County Schools, and I'm here to say thank you. So the teachers, the aides, the staff, the substitutes, the administration at every one of our schools. We've gone through quite a lot of changes in the past few months, quickly learning and implementing new ways of providing content, keeping up engagement, losing coworker connections, changing guidelines, new technologies, all while having to balance your home lives with many of you having children of your own to educate as well. So I applaud you all for making it through this career-altering, personal identity-changing, time spurred on by yet an uncontrolled worldwide health pandemic. I've spoken to some of you and I've heard the stories of the late nights, the early mornings, the crashed computers, the why is this program not working? So thank you all for stepping up to the challenges presented during this historic time. What I want to focus on next is how to best navigate what happens from here. I believe COVID-19 will be with us and force us to change how we do many things for quite some time yet. And as you look to the fall and review what feedback has been provided, I encourage you to use all the resources available to you. The Clark County Public Schools has a limited and overworked IT and IT security staff. And are they able to get help from other resources? Have they been able to use best practices established by other jurisdictions, other universities, other schools in the area? and can you be as a guide for us. CCPSIT should not have to work through this, this all on their own. 
You did this all with no preparation. So please do not grade yourself or your peers based on this past semester. Instead, go forward using collaboration with your peers elsewhere in the county. It was hard to watch every single teacher try and reinvent the wheel when it came to online instruction. You all had things that worked. You all had things that didn't. And please try to take the good and the bad from this experiment and use the, your growth mindset to move forward. The last and upcoming school year might be the toughest to be an educator, or they might just be the most exciting and most revolutionary. On another point, internet availability and access to technology for all families has to be a priority. What is in place was not sufficient. And finally, and most important, there needs to be a serious look at the mental health impact of having students, staff, administration, and families. This has been a huge change to life as we know it. Losses from personal connections, face-to-face -face gatherings, lots of activities that brought us joy and brought us to our community, to actual deaths and how that has changed. So I ask that much more support from CCPS, from their mental health resources, going to help each other come away with this as healthy as possible. Thank you again for all your time and your very hard work. Thank you. Thank you. We did have a number of comments that were sent in by email. Uh, so when the announcement went out last Friday, uh, we solicited feedback. Uh, also sent a Twitter message out and a Facebook posting out over the weekend, soliciting feedback as well from parents. And I did get, I guess there must be about a half dozen maybe. And I will share these with Renee to make part of the record. The first is from Stephen Mayer. Uh, good evening and reading the agenda for the board meeting scheduled for June 15. We have some comments, questions about how school will proceed in the fall. We appreciate all the hard work that the Clark County teachers have shown. They are truly dedicated to their students and families. The school continues, if, if school continues virtual learning slash distance learning in the fall, will all teachers be able to interact with their students via Zoom or Google Meets? Second question, in regards to the proposed plan for the fall, the students go to school two days a week what are working parents to do the other days they are not in school? And then third, if parents choose remote learning, how will this work for students? Second comment is from Dave Ferreira. Good evening, I'm a teacher who works in a different district. How are teachers with children supposed to teach full-time when their own children are part-time? I also would like to know why Zoom was not utilized for learning and growing. Children need to be educated, and I hope Clark is on the same page with neighboring districts. Third comment from Yvonne Rivera. As a parent of two elementary students, I'd like to ask that DG Cooley and Boyce Elementary please schedule siblings for the same school days. This would make finding daycare much easier as they would be on the same schedule. It will also allow working parents to be able to work the school days. Kimberly Stiles, Dr. Bishop and school board members, I'd like to comment on the proposal for how to begin the 2021 school year. First, let me say that I recognize that you are required to respond to the governor's mandates and that this cannot be easy for you to do. The, suggestion for, the suggested proposal does not seem to consider all of the families that will have a hardship due to the fact that both parents work outside the home. During this past spring of distance learning, many parents were working from home also. So while it presented some challenges, the issues of childcare was non-existent in many homes. However, by the time school starts, most parents will not be working from home any longer. This presents great difficulty with children attending school only two days a week or on an alternating schedule. Parents cannot be taking days off so regularly in order to stay home with their children. Additionally, some parents work outside of the home only on certain days, so being able to coordinate their children being in school on those days would be necessary in those homes. Perhaps parents need to be surveyed on their availability to be home with their children so that homes are not impacted in such a difficult way. 
While I recognize the logistical nightmare of this idea to a school division, you need to consider the families you are serving. If a form was to be developed that automatically sorts children based on responses, some of this could be taken care of simply by polling parents. Regardless of what plan gets sent to the governor, what I'm really disappointed by is the fact that the governor and the CDC are able to mandate such requirements when anyone who has ever spent time in a school knows how absurd it all is. We cannot educate our children like this. What disappoints me most is that school boards, superintendents, principals, and teachers aren't banging together across the state to tell the governor that this is not realistic or reasonable. While schools can and should change simple policies like cleaning procedures, we need to get back to educating our children with the 21st century skills in mind. How are our children supposed to collaborate under such circumstances? This spring has been detrimental to our students and schools. The people in the education system should be fighting to get back instead of allowing the governor to continue creating hardships for students, parents, and teachers across the state. Uh, Lisa Payne. She recently responded to a survey that was sent out, uh, but was wondering if there'll be any parent involvement in the planning. Uh, she's the parent of a soon to be first grader at Cooley, and also a teacher with 15 years of experience thinking through logistics and patterns of student behavior, AKA setting up classrooms. While I'm a stay at home mom right now, I'm also on the board for the Clark County Library and would be willing to serve in any way possible or offer feedback. In my survey, I suggested doing an AM-PM model for elementary students similar to old AM-PM kindergarten models. Students could be assigned a teacher as they would normally, but the class could be split in half, having one group attend AM and the other PM. When the state enters a phase of complete reopening, the class would come together as one. Logistics for breakfast and lunch might have to be worked out for some as well as transportation, but it could help with distancing in the classrooms. In any case, I wish you and your administrators the best, and you have my support. I know that this is a heavy and involved logistical process, and I wish you the best as you undertake it. Please let me know if I can be of service. Uh, Debbie O'Keefe, good evening. Uh, unfortunately, I cannot attend the school board meeting on Monday due to my husband working, and I don't have child care. I heard the governor's speech, and I have read the board docs for the school board meeting. I understand from my other two boys that they might have a delayed entry to school and they might only attend two days a week while doing virtual learning the other three days of the week. They have done very well with virtual learning, so I'm okay with them only going a few days a week. However, the third son, I won't use his name, learns differently and needs to be back in school. It is my understanding that the phases of opening does not apply to special education. The governor even mentioned how important it was to get sped kids back in school, so no matter what phase everyone else was in, it would not apply. I really want my student to go back full time as much as possible. He thrives on routine and watching his peers. I understand he will have to be six feet apart from his peers, and I will encourage him to wear a face mask. They've already been practicing. Just the student has made huge progress in the last two years at Boyce Elementary, and it came to a halt when the pandemic arrived. I completely understand why schools were closed and completely understand we are all figuring this out together. I'm extremely happy with how well the teachers, admin, and staff have all handled things throughout this unprecedented time, but I'm also very hopeful things can go back to normal as much as possible for everyone, especially my son. I'm writing because I know how hard this, uh, this time is for all of you, but I do plan on trying to get my student back to as much of a routine as possible. Can you please let me know what the plan for special education is? Thank you so much for all you've done during this time. I can't imagine how hard it's been for all of you. I'll absolutely do everything I can to work together with you all. Thank you so much for all you do. And then the third one, or the last one, is from a teacher, and it's long, uh, but she provided me a um, kind of a summary, <laughs> because I guess she knew that it would be longer than three minutes if I was to read it. Uh, Dr. Bishop, school board members and administrators and fellow colleagues. I understand that CCPS, CCPS needs to make a decision on opening schools for the 2021 school year. I know it has been hard for administrators to have to make these decisions. I'm writing to you regarding the opening of schools. My viewpoint comes from being a teacher as well as being a parent. I realize that there are many unknowns to factor in as far as opening schools. I understand that three different options are being considered. I would like to share my, op my opinion regarding the options. And it looks like most likely we will be entering phase three of reopening schools. In my opinion, I feel the biggest challenge will be doing the hybrid option. 
Uh, so I'm going to get to her summary, um, and I can provide this to anybody that wants to actually read her questions. So teacher concerns, uh, teachers struggling to maintain a balance uh, with their family as well as work responsibilities. Uh, job duties, providing lessons face-to-face, -face, online, hard copies to students without internet, extra lunch time in classrooms, duty-free time without kids to eat lunch and plan, and temperature checks. Uh, missing academic time due to transitions. An un unknown opening of schools and safety. Uh, are students super spreaders? No one seems to know how risky it is. Uh, a second round of closing is possible. Um, will phase three be temporary? Uh, there won't be a routine. Will teachers and students have the resources they need? Uh, will our school district get money from the government that will, we need to be successful? Uh, high risk, uh, teachers who are elderly, teachers who are high risk to the virus. Uh, subs, last year we had a sub shortage or perceived sub shortage. Uh, it will be harder to find subs. Uh, teachers, will teachers have to use carts to move uh, to each room as IE specials teachers? Lots of unknowns, increasing more stress among teachers. Also the unknown of not knowing the unknown. So then, as a parent, she adds, um, working and struggling to, to work as well as take care of her children if they are not in school. Uh, academic concerns, transition and lost time. Uh, the unknown of opening schools in terms of safety. Uh, second round of closing due to the pandemic. Uh, an interruption of school again for closures. And then fine arts, will children have the opportunity to have band and chorus? And I'll address some of these later on, uh, but that was from Nicole Beavers, who was a reading specialist at Boyce Elementary School and also a parent of students in our division. Uh, so those are all the email comments I got, uh, so half a dozen or so, um, but certainly we'll take additional feedback from parents or other community members um, whenever they want to reach out to us. Okay, thank you. Um, Considerations of policies for second reading. Um, on May 11, 2020, the board approved the following policies for first reading. They are presented tonight for second reading and adoption. You can see the list below. I won't go through it. Any questions about second reading? We have a motion. I move to accept the policies presented uh, to be accepted for second reading and adoption. <clears throat> um, any discussion? All in favor? Aye. Um, all opposed? Um, consideration of policies for first and second reading on Friday, June 12th, 2020, the policy committee discussed, policy committee discussed proposed revisions to following policy and are presented for first reading. Again, you can see the list below. I'm going to go through them. Um, any questions about? on the policies. May I have a motion? I move to accept the policies presented for first and second reading. Or second? Second. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 All opposed? Consideration of policies for first reading on Friday, June 12th, policy committee discussed proposed revisions to fund policies and are presented for first. Um, first reading is DG, DJF, GBEB, JFCD, JHCF, CCPS. Any questions? We have a motion. I'll move to accept the policies presented in first reading. Is there a second? Second. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 All opposed? Um, discussion of regulation GCBD CCPSR. Okay, yeah, yeah. School board regulation GCBD CCPS R addresses employee absences, leave, and terminal pay. Uh, with the regulation, administrators may begin the fiscal year with 30 days, 240 hours of annual leave, while other 12 month employees may begin with 25 days or 200 hours. It depends on where you are or what your position is to whether or not you're a 247-day employee, a 240-day employee, 
Uh, my leave does not apply and is determined by contractual arrangements with the board. Uh, currently, we have 18 employees from the school division and joint administrative services that are carrying annual leave balances were not used due to the pandemic. Uh, it's requested that each employee be allowed to carry over up to eight days or um, uh, for 40 hours uh, of leave. And that's a typo. It should actually be five days or 40 hours of leave from FY 20 to 21. Uh, that would set the maximum annual leave for 12 month employees at 280. Uh, 240 hours or 240 hours, depending on the length of the contract for July 1, uh, beginning July 1, 2020. Uh, the leave that is carried over, I would uh, recommend that it be extended by December 31st of 2020. And it is not anticipated that this action would be requested again on FY21. So, again, there's a typo there that should be five days or 40 hours up to that amount. Um, any questions for Dr. Bishop? So this would be a one-year uh, carryover. It would reset the limit. Would that That's always correct. be at the higher level? That's correct. I'm not advocating for a policy change or a regulation change. It's just with the, the spring, the way things played out, uh, that it be given for one year. I think that's reasonable. And, and, and so um, the, the reason folks weren't able to take leave is because there's nowhere to go or because they didn't go anywhere. They were busy here. I mean, the, the amount of work that happened behind the scenes, people will never understand what has happened since March 13th. Um, so one, nowhere to go. Uh, but secondly, not able to get away. Yeah, I mean, I, I can. I, I feel like personally, I can. I can get behind. You know, there was so much work to do that everyone was, you know, being called to action, and therefore, you know, gave up potential time to 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 do it. I mean, um, regardless of where you have the opportunity to go, or whether you stayed home and just, you know, check out the work for a week, um, I think that's less of a compelling um, argument to extend leave. I mean, everyone's in the same boat, right? It's, everything was closed. There was nowhere to go. You could just stay home. Um, but that doesn't mean that you have to be working unless you're being called to action. And, you know, if you're saying that that's, that's what, you know, this is about, then I can support that. The amount of work that people did was pretty amazing. And one of the things that I think we all learned about working from home, something that I don't want to do 100% of the time for sure, uh, but people who do it, more power to them. <laughs> but I found that I worked more hours uh, because you don't walk away from your desk, you don't walk away from your computer, it's your bag. Uh, so, I mean, the amount of work, but the honest answer is two reasons. But certainly the amount of work that was done is is a huge reason. Good. Okay. So may I have a motion? I move to authorize the carryover of up to 40 hours of annual leave for each 12 month employee from FY20 to FY21, exclusive of the division superintendent and that all carryover amounts must be used by December 31st, 2020. Is there a second? Second. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 All opposed? Discussion of 2021. Discussion of 2021. You know what's going to happen. Next year. <laughs> That's right. Discussion of next year. Yes. So I, I think it's appropriate that. Um, I kind of follow up on what uh, Ms. Smith said when she came up. Schools have done a, an amazing job under a fairly difficult circumstances. And graduation was an example of that. Um, I was there for a period of time. I actually met Anna up there uh, so the media could cover the event. She and uh, Jeff were up there taking pictures and talking to people. And, and uh, it was very well reported. We had lots of smiling faces. 
Um, students actually got more kind of individual time graduating in this capacity, in this way, than they would have if their name had been called and they'd have walked across the stage and got their diploma. It wasn't with all the pomp and circumstance. It wasn't with the crowd, uh, but it was pretty special. Um, we had virtual awards programs in, in buildings. Uh, we had uh, you know, teachers who were reaching out and guidance counselors who were reaching out to students in need. Um, I guess it was probably toward the latter part of April, uh, our guidance counselors asked for the opportunity to reach out to students and be able to do that through Google Meets if they had students that they knew were in some difficulty or that the family circumstances weren't the best. So folks were engaged. And even though the circumstances weren't ideal, uh, we did about as well as anybody in, in making this work. Um, while Google Classroom has its challenges, uh, we did not have, uh, we, we didn't pay, you know, one and a half million dollars to use it, uh, like some close school divisions paid for other service providers, and then to have those blocked. Uh, so uh, it, it was difficult. Teachers did an amazing job. Our kids did an amazing job. Our parents did a great job uh, under, under very trying uh, circumstances. Um, before I kind of get into this presentation for this evening, it was revised a little bit today uh, with a couple of slides, some pictures, because I think pictures in a lot of ways say a thousand words. Um, this room is an example. All of you know what it typically looks like. Um, chairs much more tightly packed together. Uh, we have 24 or 25 chairs in here right now, but that's six feet. Um, it impacts what we do and how we do it. And I can appreciate the passion that our parents and our community have uh, about our school division and education in general. It's no accident that 70% you know, of our students earn an advanced diploma every year. It's no accident that a high percentage of our students go on to college uh, and uh, do very well in school uh, and, and higher education, whether they start at Lord Fairfax or they move on to uh, one of the uh, four-year institutions, or go to a trade school for that matter. Uh, and no one wants to return to school more than I do. Uh, I'm a creature of habit like a lot of people are, and I, I like routine. Uh, so I can assure you that nobody wants to be in school more than, more than I do. Um, it's what's best for our community, the Commonwealth, and most importantly, our students. And as hard as the last few months have been on adults and the way it's changed our lives, I can only imagine how it's affected our students socially, emotionally, and academically, and it's immeasurable uh, how it's affected them. And we will see that whenever we reopen our doors. There's no doubt about it. We will see the impacts of five months at home when we reopen our doors. Uh, the reopening of schools, I've said for weeks now, is key to restarting the economy. Parents need to go back to work. Um, and one way to do that is for schools to reopen. You know, I've been doing this job for nearly 15 years. And unfortunately, I've had, uh, been responsible for making some, some tough decisions. And I've been faced with things that um, I hope not to deal with again. But I can assure you that I have agonized over this decision more than I have any other ever in my career. In 15 years as a superintendent, uh, then an assistant superintendent for several years and a high school principal, uh, AD, I've done about everything. And this has been the toughest decision that I've ever had because I realized that regardless of what we do or what I recommend to you and where we end up at the end of the day, this potentially impacts almost 2,000 students. It's not 87,000 like Loudon has but I don't have to be concerned about that. We have nearly 2,000 students that are in some way going to be impacted. Uh, and I understand that I and the proposed plan that hit the uh, board docs on Friday has been quite the discussion topic on social media over the weekend. Uh, and I want our community to understand that the recommendation for you, before you is just that, it's a recommendation. It is based on the guidelines as outlined by the Virginia Department of Education. 
who uh, created a task force, a large task force of people. And the recommended guidelines from the DOE is not my plan. It's not my guideline. But I have to play by the rules. <clears throat> the document that was released by the state is 136 pages. There's a copy of it. Red recover, redesign, and restart. And it addresses a multitude of things uh, from health services to education or to instruction to transportation. Almost no stone is left unturned. But again, we have to follow or we should be following those, those recommendations. There are also lots of references in that document to both the, the CDC recommendations and guidelines as well as the Virginia Department of Health. And it was stated this weekend that this is my plan, and it is, and I'll own it. But the rest of the story wasn't stated. This plan is based on the recommendations and guidelines established by the Virginia Department of Education. And as public officials, as you all know, we take an oath of, oath of office to follow the laws and regulations and rules of, of the Commonwealth of Virginia, even those that I don't necessarily agree with. And there are parts of this plan that I have no issue saying right up front that I don't agree with necessarily. Uh, but it's fair to say that we will not operate, and I think Dr. McKenna said it very nicely, um, this is going to change and it's going to impact what we do for years to come. So you have a number of guiding principles in, in the document that I, that I shared, um, or there are four. Health and safety. Before we can educate students, they have to feel like they're safe and, and we're looking out for their health. Uh, but we have a plan that's, we have to develop a plan that's in full alignment with the CDC, the Virginia Department of Health, and the Virginia Department of Education guidelines. Flexibility. We have been told, and I've mentioned this to you several times, both in person and in email and some phone conversations, that we've been told multiple times that we have to be ready to pivot very quickly and go toward remote learning in the event of a school closure locally or the event of another statewide closure or a regional closure. Accountability, uh, student accountability for learning through clear communication, feedback, and outreach, and then equity. Um, equity of all students, special education, uh, our ELL students, our low SES students, uh, college-bound students, those who plan to go on to uh, trade school uh, in the future. And, you know, it was suggested or has been suggested that transportation be cut for a year. But over 900 students of ours rely in Clark County, rely on our transportation every day. And even if half of those are able to catch a ride with a mom or a dad or a neighbor, we still have nearly 500 students that rely on us getting them to and from school. And the lack of transportation is an equity concern. Now, how do kids get to school and access their education if we're not providing transportation? And to be honest, it, it's kind of a privileged mindset. Uh, you know, just because I don't need transportation, then we can do away with it. And that's not a good place to be. The governor's plan for reopening, just to rehash a little bit. So schools closed on March 13th, as we all remember and know well. Um, we went with an asynchronous learning model. Um, we had not in the past used a virtual face-to-face -face platform. Uh, we looked at Zoom. Uh, there were lots of issues with security with Zoom at the time. And even with Google Hangouts, even though we were using it administratively, we weren't sure how it would work in an environment with 20 kindergartners or 20 third graders or 20 seniors for that matter. Um, so we chose to stick mostly with an asynchronous model, but we did have some limited synchronous learning and toward the end of our, our school year, we were piloting Google Meets with several teachers. We had a third grade teacher at Cooley, we had some teachers at Johnson Williams who were using it just to see what kinks we needed to work out. And overall, the reports from teachers have been positive. I did talk with a, teacher, with a parent whose child was in the third grade, grade classroom at Cooley, 
who indicated that they had a little bit of an internet access issue. Uh, they, don't, they don't have the best access at their home. Her son was able to log on and participate with his classmates, but then got kicked out. Uh, he lost connection, and by the time he logged back on, it was over. Uh, so, again, that's, we know that's a problem we have to address. So, phases one through three in the governor's plan don't have a definitive date. Um, it, it mirrors the, the phases of the business reopening plan, but not totally. You may move from one phase to the next when you've developed your plans and you are have submitted those to the, the board vets them and then you've submitted those to the state. Uh, the plan does address the health and social health and social, emotional and physical well-being of our students and staff. Uh, we have our uh, instruction department right now is looking at several different programs or platforms to be able to address social emotional learning. Uh, and some of the needs of our students. It prioritizes the need, phases one through three prioritizes the need of the most vulnerable learners for whom in-person instruction is most essential. There is a mandate for teaching new material. Then the executive order that, that this is couched under is actually from the Department of Health, from the Health State Health Commission or whatever his official title is. But there are potential legal issues if you fail to comply. So under phase one, we may offer ESY, compensatory services, uh, or compensatory services for students with disabilities. We are still in a remote learning situation. Uh, Mr. Moore is currently working through this process. We are starting to work toward teletherapy for speech. And we'll be reaching out if, if we uh, to families who are uh, some of our most uh, severe students in terms of special education services. Start there, and and then work uh, work through all 220 students with IEPs. But again, instruction is still a remote uh, setting. You might recall that we did survey our teachers. Dr. Steele surveyed our teachers, and we had less than a dozen people who are interested in doing anything in summer school. Several special education teachers, which allows us to do some of this compensatory service work, uh, some related service providers in the division that allows us to do things like speech. Um, we had very few teachers who were interested in summer school for this current, uh, for the current summer. So if we are to go into the buildings, however, uh, we would be, uh, have a max of 10 people per classroom, or on a bus, uh, we would have to uh, have six feet of separation when possible. Uh, no large gatherings, uh, communal spaces, cafeterias, etc., would have to be closed. There would be no athletics or extracurricular activities. What does six feet separation mean? Possible. So that question came up with the state superintendent. So that, when possible, is a little bit of a disclaimer that if I walk by. Ms. Singh Smith to sharpen my pencil and I come within six feet of her that that's okay. I'm just going to sharpen my pencil. Uh, but six feet of separation should be should be kept um, between students and staff whenever possible. Yeah, so by design, it needs to be six feet. If there's some I'm incidental, fine, that, right. Okay. Yeah. If there's some incidental walking within the side of the six foot bubble, then that's okay. So phase two. Uh, in addition to our, to our special education students, uh, our English language learners and students, pre, uh, students in grades pre-K to three may be served, uh, primarily still remote. Uh, social distancing is required on buses and in buildings, six feet separation when possible. It does move to a 50 person limit on larger gatherings or assemblies. Graduation was actually listed in that too. Since we've already had that, I didn't list it. Uh, communal spaces should remain closed if possible or stagger their use, and then limited extracurricular activities. The Virginia High School Act League actually came out on Thursday and announced that out of season practices could be, uh, we could start considering those again uh, if we had a plan in place. But we have to submit a health plan, and I know that's the next item on the agenda for your consideration. Under phase three, Instruction would shift to more in-person uh, contact. Uh, remote instruction would be provided to supplement that in-person contact. 
for in-person instruction. Uh, schools may stagger schedules, six feet of separation when possible, restricting the mixing of students. And what that means is like students who are changing classes at the high school or middle school, that mix that happens at the end of the tone uh, when the class is over, uh, adjusting schedules, transitions, recess options and instruction, and athletics and extracurricular activities may be expanded. So the guidance document actually suggests some potential schedules uh, for resuming in-person teaching and learning. And I've had a lot of conversations, uh, several conversations over the last week, including two today. Uh, and this plan forces you to do an alternating schedule uh, because of the social distancing. And again, we'll kind of get to that in just a few minutes. In all phases, uh, we will be required to health screen students and staff daily on a screening device or a screening instrument, I should say, that is provided by the Virginia Department of Health. If you've been to the doctor's office lately, then you know that when you go, you have to, or they will either text you or email you a series of questions you have to respond to. And my daughter at the orthodontist office last week texted me a, a screening instrument that I had to answer a series of questions. Uh, same with this. Uh, we are asked to work with students and staff who are immunocompromised or at higher risk of infection. For staff uh, who come within six feet of a student, they should wear a face covering. So if I'm standing at my, my uh, whiteboard and I'm teaching, uh, and then I go to help an individual student, I need to put my face mask or face covering on at that point. And then encourage students to use face coverings as developmentally appropriate. Uh, when social distancing cannot be maintained. Uh, the governor's uh, press conference, I guess it was nearly two weeks ago now, he suggested or recommended that uh, anyone 10 years or older uh, wear a face cover. I have not seen the screening instrument from the Virginia Department of Health yet, so I don't know how in depth it goes. Uh, I did speak with your board attorney this morning who recommended that we address students and staff issues on a case-by-case -case basis. Um, may require a doctor's note if someone isn't planning to return to work. And then perhaps uh, those teachers could teach remotely, which we had already discussed internally. So the phase three reentry. If we look at the ends of the spectrum, uh, those are fairly easy. To, to talk about. So 100% remote learning would be one extreme. Uh, we would enhance the structure, uh, both asynchronous and synchronous, and then there would be grade, grading done and descriptive feedback to students on the new material that they would be taught. Or in a perfect world, 100% in person uh, and uh, with certain mitiga mitigation strategies in place. So the challenges, and I, I reshuffled the deck here a little bit today when I reposted this. From the very beginning, uh, and any of my administrative team who was on uh, virtual meetings with me could attest to this. One of the things we talked about from the very beginning is while this is a school plan, it needs to meet a greater community need, particularly with child care. So the best way to do that, obviously, particularly for elementary students, is to have them in the building every day. Many middle and high school students obviously can kind of self-advocate, take, take care of themselves, but we were concerned about our elementary students. Compliance with mitigation strategies. Uh, certainly, we would have to be in a situation where, where we were doing that. Transportation. The number of our <laughs> passengers on a bus has been severely limited and the number of available buses and drivers. A, a, a basic school bus that we purchase every year has two, or has three features extra that we get. We get drop down chains for inclement weather. We get a white roof because typically it's a little bit cooler on the bus. And we get tinted glass again, more often than not because it's cooler on the bus. Those are the three special items that we get on every bus that we order. One of those buses is about $82,000. So just to keep that in terms of an order of magnitude of you know, well, how much does the bus cost? $82,000. So when we start thinking about the budget, 
Additional teachers obviously are going to cost money. And we did receive 148,000 in CARES Act funding, as I mentioned uh, previously. So we know that there's a significant hardship on parents, particularly when it comes to child care and returning to work. Um, it has been suggested that we combine classes. So I'll use Cooley as an example. Somebody said, well, maybe we should put our kindergarten and first grade students together. And if we have 36 of them, that's three classes. Cooley will have approximately 120 kindergartners and first graders. We have six current teachers assigned to those two grade levels, 20 students per classroom. So in order to maintain the social distancing, six teachers has to become 12. And we don't have the budget to hire six more teachers to teach K and one at Cooley. So then the picture, so on Saturday night, Somebody in this room could attest to this. I got, um, I decided I was going to cool it. I guess it was about 10 o'clock and set up a classroom. So this is a fourth grade classroom. This was Ms. Fincham's room last year. Uh, she actually um, uh, has been with us just one year. And I went in and it's, it's not totally set up. Uh, it is a fairly barren classroom. There's not a lot of extra stuff in there. So you have a teacher desk, you have two bookshelves, a larger one and a smaller one, you have a file cabinet. And the edge of the table that you can see on the bottom, at the bottom of the picture, is her kidney-shaped table for reading groups. So that is a picture of 20 desks in the classroom. Those desks are approximately three feet apart. I left enough room between those desks to put a chair under the desk and for that chair to be scooted out fairly easily and not infringe on your neighbor behind you. So there's our 20 desks. Social distancing guidelines look like this. There are now 10 desks in that classroom and, and they are six feet apart. So again, the picture is worth a thousand words when you start to think about the social distancing requirements and, and teaching staff in a building and the number of students in a building on a given day. So we considered a lot of options. Looked at AM and PM shifts. Basically half of our students would go in the morning, half in the afternoon. Um, when we look at childcare, that's probably not ideal. Most people can't get off in the middle of the day to take care of their children if you went to the AM shift. And then how do you provide childcare for half a day if your child is assigned to a PM shift? Transportation then is also a concern. Alternating day or week, and there are iterations to all of these. Uh, so these are just five plans, but I looked at different options within each plan as well. So an alternating day, um, and those could be done Monday, Wednesday, Friday, uh, Tuesday, Thursday. Uh, so those of you who are familiar with the middle and high school schedule, if you look at just kind of the AB day, so three days one week in a certain group of classes, two days the next week. Um, again, child care, as we start to think about it, if your child was going three days to school week one on Monday, Wednesday, Friday, and was going to be in school Tuesday, Thursday the next week, week one, you need child care on Tuesday, Thursday. Week two, you need child care on Monday, Wednesday, Friday. So again, trying to, and looking at this, trying to, to make it as reasonable as we could for people who might have child care concerns. And then alternating weeks. Again, week one, your student is in school. Week two, they're off, week, and they would be learning remotely. Week three, they're back in. Week four, they're off learning remotely. Um, might be easier for people to find childcare one week at a time, but do we really want our students to be away from their classrooms for an entire week with no touch points other than every other week with their teachers? So then we looked at one twice per week. And that one also had two iterations, Monday, Wednesday, Tuesday, Thursday, or one group of students, Monday, Tuesday, 
the second group of students Wednesday, Thursday, um, and, and ultimately thought, okay, if you're in that early group, you're a, a first grader and you go to school Monday and Tuesday, you're not back in school for another five days. What I call the two, three plan, uh, that was middle and high school students would be in school on alternating days at AB on Monday and Tuesday. Elementary students would be in school Wednesday through Friday. And then we'll have two days of remote learning on Monday and Tuesday. While our elementary, while our middle and high would be remote Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. Uh, so we looked at that option. That one, staffing becomes a big issue. Because again, with social distancing, if every elementary school is in school for those three days, we basically need double the number of elementary teachers. And then the 3 1 plan. So that plan was elementary would be in school every day for three weeks, home for one, middle and high would be home for three, and then school for one. And when they were out of school, it would be remote, uh, synchronous and asynchronous. So when you start looking at, at the options um, and the guidelines from the state, uh, it becomes pretty obvious that in order to meet the recommendations that you have to have two groups of students. So the recommended schedule, I would, I would suggest that we take a look at and you consider uh, a start date of September 1 instead of August 18 uh, for a few reasons. Uh, one is uh, planning. Uh, secondly, uh, that phase three window will be more settled, I hope at that point. And third, as school divisions start to return to school earlier, then um, we'll see what happens in those divisions. The frustrating thing about this for a lot of school divisions is, and I'll use my, my colleague in Radford as an example, Radford City has, has eight confirmed cases of coronavirus since it started. None require hospitalization and there have been no deaths. They have not had a confirmed case since early May. Yet the guidelines here are the very same for them. Dickinson County has had zero cases. Bath County has had zero cases. The guidelines are the same. So a start date of September 1, uh, two days per week uh, would be the plan. Uh, elementary students would go uh, Monday, Wednesday, Tuesday, Thursday schedule. Our middle and high school students would also have two days. So some would go on Monday and have their A day classes. And on Wednesday, they would have their B day classes. The second group of high school students would go on Tuesday and have A day classes for middle school and high school. Tuesday, A day classes. Thursday, B day classes. And that model, every student gets all the classes they signed up for, including the arts band, vocal music, visual arts, CTE courses, et cetera. Uh, we also considered in one plan reducing the number of uh, classes that a high school and middle school student could take. And then if you're not careful, all of a sudden you start impacting people's potential credits for graduation. So we have to be really careful of that. And we didn't want to destroy any program. Because every high school, every ninth grader going to the high school next year, as an example, would have their four core classes. Health and PE would be class five. And if they were reduced to six classes, they would have one more class of their choosing. And for many of our students, that would be a year of foreign language. There would be no elective courses for that group of ninth grade students. So we, we began to limit uh, what uh, our students could take and didn't want to impact uh, their, um, uh, their graduation requirements, obviously. So Fridays, what would Friday be? Small group work. Uh, reading specialists might pull a group of kids virtually and do uh, a, a reading group. Uh, math interventionists might work with our with students who need additional support in math. At the high school and middle school, you might have a chemistry work session or help session uh, where um, Mr. Aiello logs on and helps students through chemistry 
problems as they're trying to solve those or, or chemistry curriculum. We are also considering having special education students and other students who receive services, ELO, et cetera, into school more frequently than just two days a week in order to make sure we're meeting those IEP goals and, and uh, service times. All of this will be in the big plan that we're still working on. Every, every department is working on a plan right, or their portion of the plan right now. Um, consider an option for parents to choose remote learning. I got two emails this week that Renee forwarded to me from parents who said, I don't feel comfortable sending my student back to school yet. What do I need to do? Will the board consider a remote learning option? We have some students whose parents don't feel comfortable yet and might not for the foreseeable future. So we want to be able to accommodate those folks to the best uh, of our ability. And you know, when we have teachers, and we will have some, I can almost assure you that medical conditions, pre-existing conditions will keep them from returning to work. So those teachers would then be assigned to do virtual learning. Now, we also will have to find somebody to take over their in-person classes. So there will be a, a bit of a personnel impact somewhere along the way. Uh, but again, a lot of this will be worked out. I haven't even really talked about transportation yet. And, and a 65 passenger bus, uh, Randy and Teresa have run the numbers and, and measured distances. Uh, 10 students on a 65 passenger bus. We have a handful of 77 passenger buses. Those buses could accommodate 12 students. And we have many buses that would have to do three, two, three, four routes just to deliver the same number of students to school. So our to-do list, uh, development of these departmental plans. My goal is to be able to put these plans together uh, and be able to submit that to the Department of Education in a booklet so that everything's well laid out uh, from health and safety to instruction, including remote learning if we have to go back in that direction uh, or the periods of time that students aren't in school. Uh, food service, you know, if students can't, if they're not supposed to be in a congregate setting in the cafeteria, where do they eat lunch? Well, in the classroom. Well, if they're eating in the classroom, then who's monitoring the classroom lunch period? Because we also need to provide a, a lunch period for our teachers. Uh, so all of those are details that have to be worked out. Purchasing, this is very expensive to prepare. Uh, so far, we've ordered 250 student desks because a lot of our elementary classrooms in particular use tables. Uh, every kindergarten room you've probably ever been in, uh, there are tables and not desks. Uh, infrared thermometers, we've already ordered 50 of those to help us with the screenings every morning. Uh, computers for elementary students. Uh, Mr. Schubert has already ordered a lot of computers. And I don't mean like a lot, I mean a, a lot, like 200 to 250. Um, that we could give to elementary students who need a device at home. We know we have a lot of families that have plenty of devices. For those who need it, we could provide that. Hotspots, I have already begun to stockpile sanitizer, wipes, gowns, face shields for our clinics, and gowns for our clinics, face masks and gloves, uh, reception shields at our reception areas in school and in this office, uh, bottle fillers. Anybody that's ever been to an elementary school and watched a student drink out of a water fountain? <laughs> uh, it's um, uh, not as sanitary as one might hope. Uh, we'll put it that way. So bottle fillers, so that a student can take a bottle and fill it up in their mouth. It's not on the bubble or part. Um, so we're looking at a lot of different things, but all of this is very expensive. Uh, and, and some of it we've already purchased going into next year. That's a lot. And I know I've taken a lot of time. Uh, I do have a series of questions that I know that we'd probably like to get to at some point. So I'll stop and let you guys ask me questions, and then we'll get to these questions that you kind of Sure. How do we want to do it? Because we know we have questions for them. So I feel like we should just go ahead and go through the questions. And then I'm assuming if people have been taking mental notes, and then we can go from there with the discussion. Does that, does that work? Yeah? Okay. What kind of questions? So I, I, 
went back to the document that, that was shared uh, and kind of grouped them into different uh, categories. So parent community input is the first. So communication with parents, uh, bi-weekly or weekly communication uh, throughout the summer. Uh, communication is one of those things that needs to be timely and there needs to be some substance to it. Uh, and certainly I understand the importance of communication, um, but I don't want to send out empty communication. Uh, that basically says, well, we're, we don't know anything yet. Um, I know people were starting to wonder about next year, and as we all know, we finally got the guidance last Tuesday. Uh, so we'll be working through uh, our communication pro channels and processes. Our Facebook page has gotten a ton of hits. Um, some of the posts get 1,500 views or whatever the appropriate term is. Um, so we'll work on the communication piece. We'll make sure people get timely information uh, when there's something to communicate. Um, gathering input from committees like CX, CTE on plans for next year. Um, it was already mentioned about low SES students and, and special ed students, ELL, et cetera. And, and I'll give some thought to how we could survey those families. Um, once the plans are developed, we can send a draft for feedback to CX and CT committee in particular and school health advisory board. That's the third one that I think has a maybe a key part of this. Uh, we're lucky enough to have several medical uh, professionals on that board who can give us some, some feedback there. So we'll get copies out. Um, it has to be done in context. Uh, so there needs to be an understanding of this document too and what the requirements are um, because it's gonna seem very restrictive. Opportunity to involve a group of parents in providing positive, constructive feedback for teachers in regards to virtual lesson plans. I'd like to handle that differently. Uh, I would like to work with our technology department to see if we can come up with a, with a template or a format for people to submit their, um, their online lessons. Uh, so there's some consistency there. So when a parent opens a um, one for reading and one for math, they look the same, even though the activities are obviously going to be different. Equity issues for students with disabilities. I've mentioned how we're trying to work right now on that, as well as how we'll try to address that next year with having those students come in more frequently than our regular ed or gen ed population. Um, lack of reliable, in addition to addressing equity issues such as lack of reliable internet service and parents having to leave children home so they can work, are we collecting feedback and engaging families to ensure that necessary tools and support are available? We actually, during this, the course of the closure, ended up uh, handing out through the Virginia Star program about a dozen machines to families uh, who uh, had applied, uh, some who contacted us that said, I need a device. Uh, Mr. Facemeyer actually came in and, and reworked some of the devices and got them ready. Uh, and we were able uh, to one, either meet parents and have them pick, a, pick them up at school. I met some parents here at this building after hours and they picked them up. Mr. Catlett took care of delivering one. Uh, so we got devices out as best we could. I also want to have some conversation with some different community groups about the possibility of having some hotspot locations around the county. And we have the one at Johnson Williams that was rarely used, but most many people in Berryville have reliable access. Uh, so I thought about Blue Ridge Fire Department, thought about the voice area, and how we might be able to work with some of our community folks to have some equipment placed there so that we can have some hotspot access even remotely in those buildings. Uh, questions about guidance counselors and general education teachers staying connected to provide some support. I've already mentioned that our guidance counselors were really involved in working with some students. Our IBP staff and kids on, who were on those caseloads, uh, there were some daily check-ins with those kids. I started with a survey, smiley face, sad face, how are you feeling today? And then some interaction between IBP staff and, and students and families. Um, always room for improvement there though. Uh, and adding the layer of Virtual in-person kind of connection will help with that. Instruction and technology, uh, can you share the options or platforms being considered for remote instruction? Um, Mr. Shoebridge or Dr. Shoebridge and 
Uh, Pat Hauseman have been working on that. Uh, they have uh, would recommend that we continue using Google because people are familiar with it. Um, there was a large contract signed across the mountain a week or so ago with Schoology, uh, an expensive program. Uh, I know Fairfax County used Blackboard, which had uh, about a million and a half dollars worth of, um, of license. And our folks, our kids are used to using Google Classroom. Um, and while we can do some things differently within the program, I think, of the platform itself uh, to organize better, it seems to work in most cases. And as good as any technology works, I guess. And again, it's, it's a financial issue. I mean, the blackboards and the school issues of the world are very expensive. We actually had a teacher, and if you go back and look at the teacher survey, we have a teacher at Johnson Williams that has a Schoology account. And she uses that, and she actually says, the only reason I, I know it's hers is because she's the only one who uses it, that next year, if we're in a remote learning situation, she will not use Schoology because it's hard to understand. But it's actually in the teacher survey. You can go back and look and find her comment. Uh, the benefits of using Google Classroom versus purchasing rights to an online platform. I mentioned I already said that. How can we implement synchronous learning while students are working remotely? There needs to be interaction. I don't disagree, but that's going to be a significant challenge and one that we'll have to work through. Teachers will be teaching students every day. So there will be a group of students who don't necessarily have face-to-face -face instruction every day. But instead of going for almost a, a quarter and a half, students would be having face-to-face -face every other day with their classroom teacher. So it'd be a different situation. Um, obviously, if we go all remote, teachers will be equipped to use Google Hangouts or Google Meets with their classroom. But teachers, this is gonna put a, a huge, uh, teachers are gonna have to really do a good job of managing because while they're teaching their classes during the day, they're also going to have to have assignments and work posted for those students who are at home that day. So while it might not be double planning, it's going to be close uh, to, to prepare for the lesson in person and to prepare for students who are at home. Uh, and it, it doesn't matter whether it's every other week or, or alternating days or a three-in-one plan, that's going to be the case. It's, it's going to be different. Uh, how will time spent with students be maximized? Already had this conversation about things like if you're an elementary school parent, you know about ST math. That won't be, shouldn't be, uh, we shouldn't be spending a lot of time on ST math in the classroom. We need to focus on direct instruction for students and, and items that don't require them to be on devices. So that'll be part of our plan that when, when you have students in front of you, that it's direct instruction. The ST map practice and other things like that can be done asynchronously while students are at home. Can school administrators and IT collaborate so remote learning plans look similar? I've already addressed that one. Um, so the next comment, a student or parent need to be able to access information quickly and efficiently. It goes along with the, the one I just mentioned about a lesson plan. Um, it's turned into an administrator is not user friendly for a student or parent. Uh, so again, I think we can address that through some kind of template. Personnel, in the case of the instructional assistants, will they, they be trained to start on how to run small groups virtually? We're going to have a number of jobs that are going to be very different moving forward, and instructional assistants very well could be one of those. Uh, we're going to have at the beginning of each morning. We're going to have, you know, let's say it's the high school, we're going to have 350 students arrive at the door to have to be health screened and temperature checked. And while some staff can be assigned to that duty, some of that will, or teaching staff, some of that's going to fall on our IAs to, to assist in that process. And we only have one nurse at every building. And just what, Rick, four years ago, we had two nurses mm -hmm. and not, didn't even have one everywhere. Uh, so nursing staff, one in each building, they're going to have to have support. So many jobs are going to change and look differently anyway. The training for IAs, we have, we have had some conversation about training them in the reading program. 
The extent that we use them at this point uh, is not determined yet. Uh, could CARES Act funding be used to support that training? Yes. And we would certainly want to identify the instructional assistance that could support a, a reading program uh, in a way that we would want it supported. Uh, specialists and how they're being utilized at this time from reading specialists, math specialists, EL teachers, directors of curriculum instruction. Uh, there hasn't been a shortage of work for anybody. Uh, at, uh, the elementary schools, I know our specialists were providing weekly assignments um, just like teachers were. Uh, they were more STEMI kinds of things, uh, more creative kinds of activities for students that might want to break from a math or a reading. Uh, assignment. Um, so uh, they have been involved. We have several uh, specialists who also have teaching license. Uh, we've talked about using them in a classroom environment. Uh, so again, that'll be part of the bigger plan. There were meetings all the time, and the next series of questions are about, you know, there are several here about meetings among team leaders and monthly staff meetings, grade level meetings. Our buildings had year-end faculty meetings. Uh, they had uh, Google Hangout meetings during the course of the closure. Uh, at the elementary level, you might have had specialist or kindergarten team or first grade team. Um, so the meetings weren't an issue and Google Meets made that possible. Uh, again, I participated in several of those with, with our schools and we used it also administratively and that frequently. For all the perception in the community that teachers were not directly uh, were kind of off after they posted their assignments. Um, we have a lot, most of our teachers for sure, I feel very comfortable saying most, were engaged daily. Now, did we have some who did not follow the guidance document and had uh, established office hours outside of what was recommended, which was 9 to 12? We did. Um, did hear some feedback on that um, after the fact. So moving forward, um, as we begin to have more in-person and maybe less contact in a remote environment, uh, that won't be as, as big an issue. Uh, but if we go have to go remote at any point during the year, then we certainly will want to make sure that people are maintaining office hours that are conducive to students and and learning and parents who might be assisting. Uh, collaboration between Boyce and Cooley teachers during the time. There was some, although most of the planning that occurred occurred in the buildings. So the kindergarten team or a first grade team was very consistent in most cases of providing lessons or, or work. Uh, that, were kind of, that was planned collaboratively with, with their colleagues. Um, work smarter, not harder. Uh, there was no reason for all four kindergarten teachers at Cooley, as an example, to plan for, their, for themselves when they could collaborate to do that together. Uh, so a lot of times you would see the same kinds of activities posted across the board uh, for grade level classrooms uh, in our elementary schools. Not in every case, but in most cases. As far as collaboration between the buildings, again, there was some, but, but not significant. But not significant. Um, work hours, I addressed that. So community questions. Um, Mr. Hobart sent me several questions just to, uh, to kind of keep in the back of my mind. Siblings on the same day, that's one of the things that we've said from the beginning, is that we needed to make sure that families were in the buildings on the same day, regardless of what the schedule was. So we'll work through that process. So when students aren't in school, what happens? Again, there will be some who are in school more often, based on need, uh, but those would be a combination of synchronous and asynchronous kinds of learning experiences for those students, uh, small groups, reading, uh, and then some who weren't in those sessions would have uh, learning activities to support what they did when they were in school. Uh, use of Cooley Upper Campus. Uh, that was part of our plan. The space helps. 
one of our plans actually was to use all five buildings to house elementary students. And staffing became the issue when you start to take those classes and divide them in two. Uh, so space-wise, we could make it work. The issue is with staff and not having enough staff members to be able to accommodate all of our elementary students, even if we spread them out in, in all five buildings, including upper campus. Lack of internet in rural Clark County. Uh, we know it's an issue. Uh, we know that a hot spot will help in some cases. Um, but we've even talked about perhaps having the hot spots on buses. Uh, but even if we park a bus at a particular location, if you're on the wrong side of the ridge, you might not be able to pick up the signal. Uh, so that's something we have to continue to work through. I feel like you know, there, there are lots of unknowns still, uh, unfortunately. So the last one was some comments related to, you know, kids, this, this disease doesn't affect children. Uh, and so I called and talked to one of our parents today who is a, um, who works at our local health department. And in our Lord Fairfax Health District, we have had cases of confirmed COVID-19 in youth and in infants. And there's even part of uh, the thought process is that students uh, or the children don't have the significant symptoms, but they are carriers and can share with others uh, things that they, we wouldn't want them to share. Uh, so um, even though they might not be affected in the same way as an adult, that they can transmit the virus to other individuals. So that's the extent of the questions that were, or the comments that were listed uh, in, in that shared document. Oh, let me mention transport. Well, I already mentioned transportation, by the way. So, number three. So, go ahead. Um, so, clearly, there's a lot. Um, I'm just trying to figure out how to have this conversation. Um, so, we're not approving anything tonight. I guess I want to make that clear. We're not approving anything tonight. These are recommendations um, from Dr. Bishop. Um, obviously, I know we all have a lot of questions, um, and if we feel like there are things he has not mentioned tonight that we would like him to consider, then this is our opportunity to sort of put um, those on his to-do list um, to think about. Um, so why don't we, let's maybe break this up in chunks, um, is why don't we talk about the plan to do um, you know, a couple of days, this hybrid model, obviously, which is what I think we were definitely, definitely, will definitely be doing. Um, and so we have a couple of days in school, a couple of days um, out of school for virtual learning. What are our thoughts about the hybrid model itself, high level, and then we can get into these. Um, go ahead. Okay, I can start. Um, I first want to say I I definitely support following the CDC and health department guidelines. Um, I did see um, an article today about um, waivers being available for areas that have low incidence of disease, um, and that. And I would not support applying for a waiver of these guidelines. I think that, um, and, and I don't think that we should, um, as some community members suggested, um, revolt or, or stand up to the governor and push back and, and refuse to do this. I think that following the guidelines is prudent. Um, as far as the, the hybrid model, I have a couple of questions. Um, have you had a chance yet to have any discussions with community um, providers of camps or childcare about um, filling in those gaps for working parents? And I guess I have a concern about um, if we're restricting mixing of student groups in our buildings and then they go to a camp or childcare program on the off days, it's sort of um, defeating. So, uh, if you 
given thought to that or had conversations that you share? I have, and, and I will say first that I agree with what you said second. That if we have, and that's why I said, you know, even though we're kind of bound to follow the laws and rules and regulations of the Commonwealth of Virginia, I don't necessarily always agree with them. If we're going to have students who go to a congregate setting and they're off day, why can't they just be in school? So that's one that I don't understand. But to answer your question, yes, I've had some conversations locally. Uh, and, and one conversation with our county administrator uh, in particular about how we might work together to provide at least some childcare opportunities for families who need it. Uh, and, and I won't get into any of the details right now. We do need to have some follow up conversation and, and a meeting about that with some other folks. Uh, but I can share with you kind of one on one what we're talking about and with board members but we're not in a position to disclose that at this point. Okay. So good, yes. good to know that yes. it's being given thought. I, I know that that's a major concern for families. Yes. Um, so would this be the time to talk about the remote learning? Is the right section? Yeah, I mean, I'm just, I guess we can have this organic conversation organically. I'm just, there's so much. There's so much, right? I know. So I will try not to ask all of my questions. Yeah, I mean, that's because what we're here for. <laughs> You'll right? be here until 11 o'clock. Uh, I have a lot. Um, <laughs> I, um, for parents who choose remote learning or um, as their primary mode for their students, um, I, I guess I want to encourage the use of a more comprehensive curriculum that's designed for home instruction. Um, Google Classroom can be really hard to um, keep track of where your student's at as far as progress, what is the priority because things that are not done are down at the bottom and new stuff is posted at the top. And so students will log in and start working on whatever is at the top and they haven't done the stuff from, from three days ago. Um, so something that would kind of put in front of them, do this first. Um, and this is the order that these things should be completed um, and kind of keep them on a path would be um, a big request from, you know, from, from me, That's my, my personal experience and from talking to other parents in the division, I, I found it really frustrating. Um, I understand how the platform works, but it just took a lot of time to sift through what was done and not done and um, filters and sorting capabilities, something like, like that would be um, good. And then I'll ask one more question for now and then I'll let someone else. <laughs> Can we get commitments from parents um, in that, that summer registration process that parents do on, online um, for who's sending their students, and who's doing remote. Can we get that earlier this year? And can we ask them to um, indicate whether or not they will be able to drive their students to release the burden on transportation? And, and I don't want to necessarily bury it in that process because it's a lot. Anybody that's done the online registration so what I would like to do is to kind of break that out and chunk it and do it a little bit differently. So you know, once we kind of get to the point where we're ready to say this is what's going to happen, uh, then we'll get feedback from parents and basically beg them, if you can drive your student to school, please do, um, for a lot of reasons. Uh, but for those students that absolutely need transportation, that potentially frees up capacity, I call it social distancing capacity, mm -hmm. on, on buses or in classrooms, but particularly our buses. So we'll be sending out something related to that. We also want to know who is going to choose the remote option, but we want to be able to tell them what it's going to look like. Right. So right now, Dr. Steele is working with the elementary uh, principals on kind of the elementary learning plan. Uh, Ms. Biggs is working with the middle and high school on their plan. So we've divided and conquered. And then we will come back together. It's all in a shared Google Doc that, that I can watch the progress 
uh, and then we'll have some conversation before we present it to you for uh, approval. Um, of course, you, you need to be behind it before we move forward. But yes, we want to get that information back from parents. Uh, to your point about curriculum, uh, Virtual Virginia uh, will be providing curriculum next year. That's primarily been mostly a high school program. Uh, every now and then you'll have a middle school student that takes a class through Virtual Virginia, uh, but they have added a layer of elementary curriculum. So my thought right now is that for any student who chooses for remote learning, that the Virtual Virginia curriculum will be the primary curriculum that's supplemented by other things that teachers might want to add. We know the Virtual Virginia curriculum is based on and written uh, on the standards uh, of Virginia. Uh, and it's not you know, something that's been pulled from some obscure place somewhere. Um, but that we, we are implementing Virtual Virginia in a way that allows teachers to go in and, and take content, copy and paste it, edit it, or revise it to differentiate instruction. Uh, so uh, that's our thought process right now. But the curriculum for online would primarily be Virtual Virginia supplemented by other resources. Okay. Um, so two things. You, we talked about Schoolology and Schoology. Schoology and the other one. Blackboard. And how um, it was pretty expensive. Yes. And we use Google right now, one, because most people are used to it and it's inexpensive. Correct. Are there plugins for Google Classroom and Google Meets that maybe we could think about um, investing in that might meet some of these needs that uh, Ms. Ryan's bringing I'll say maybe because I'll have to get with uh, Pat okay. to, to get them on that. Okay. our instructional technology supervisor to get Pat working on that, uh, to have him um, come up with some solutions. Okay. He will be the Google certified right. person, one of the few in the world. Uh, he will be much more knowledgeable in that than I am. So that could be a, a way of trying to, yeah, right? Um, the second thing was um, with allowing students or having parents, families choosing to keep their children home for virtual learning or remote learning, um, I am assuming that we will come up with some type of criteria or uh, its own sort of folder of guidance on um, participation of the students, you know, that there will have to be accountability, not only for the teacher and who will be teaching the, um, the coursework, but also for the, the parent and the student. That's correct. Because we'll need their commitment as well. That's correct. Right? Yes. So we're going to sort of be thinking, I'm talking out loud yes. because I know this is happening, but yeah. we'll be having to think about correct. a lot of that stuff. So. Okay. Um, as as um, as well as thinking about reentry if they decide to come right back to school, correct, right, yes. or even the other way, with parents well, deciding well, to pull their kids out. That's right. right. Okay. Any other thoughts? Um, I, I, uh, I just wanted to speak to the uh, the the two week the September first uh, opening. I just looked at the school calendar and um, you know, currently the teachers were supposed to come back uh, two weeks prior to that. So that means, you know, basically four weeks of, uh, you know, assuming the teachers come back at the same time, the students come back September 1, you're talking about a month of planning time. And I think my concern is that I suspect that launch is going to be challenging at best, uh, regardless of when we start. And, um, you know, the, the lost time, uh, just, you know, it, it's just part of my frustration of, uh, of when we closed and then we tried to start and then we had to shut down and then it was just, it just kept seeming like we were just losing time and losing time and then finally we got a little bit of traction and you know, then the school year ended. And, um, you know, it, it, I, I just, I just get the sense that, you know, again, it goes back to, I mean, from a family standpoint, um, you know, people aren't going uh, away as much as they used to. So, you know, they're going to be around, kids are going to be around. And, uh, you know, teachers have two weeks. It's going to take some time to muddle through getting everything off the ground one way or another. And 
And so I, I guess I would just like to say I'm not so hot on, you know, a, a, a delayed opening. Tomorrow, I guess the governor's going to speak more about phase three. This might, not indicated, might, so we might have more vision on that and may address the, are we going to be in the phase three window question? But um, that was, that was, that was that. So, so are you, you're saying, or your thought process is, can we, is it, can we just start on the day we were planning? Yeah. Is that what you're, yeah. okay. Yeah, I mean, you know, two more weeks, so the teachers have four weeks. <clears throat> that means it'll be a little better start, but it's still going to be a, a bumpy, you know, launch, uh, September 1. And, you know, if you got a bumpy launch, let's, let's get on with it, you know, on the 18th. I think, though, for me, I think September 1 is a good date just because there's a lot to do at the top. But there's a lot of planning and figuring out still to do. So while the teachers need their planning time as well, or their regular, you know, restart, if you will, I think, I think central office, I think we need to get our ducks in a row, but I don't want to speak for you. So do you want to talk about the September 1st date? Yeah, I mean, teacher, the whole calendar would slide. So teachers wouldn't truly have four weeks of planning. They would, we would push work days out too, um, which would allow us to, to plan and to have things in, in place more than we do today. I mean, a week after, not quite a week after the announcement from the, of the governor on what schools were going to look like. Um, with this meeting being when it was, and then planning for the next phase to bring documents to you. The next scheduled meeting right now is July like 27th. Well, that's too late. Uh, so that's why it's one I suggested the 13th. And, and then when you start to think about communicating plans to families, you're basically a month away from school opening uh, at that point. Uh, and, and about two weeks from teachers or two, three weeks from teachers return. So is that enough time? Um, then we also just buy ourselves some time or additional time to see what happens with this thing. Because there's lots of reports that say that we're going to have a, a spike at some point. Uh, again, uh, there are 19 states that have seen an increase in cases. Uh, we could uh, debate whether that's because of additional testing that's happening or whatever. Uh, but since some of the reopening plans have been put in place, um, the fact of the matter is 19 states have seen an increase in cases. Um, whether Virginia will follow that or not, I don't know. As of today, it hasn't. Um, so that's, that's kind of my take. I also think there are, I think there are a lot of moving parts. Well, there are. There are a lot of moving parts. And um, we first have to sort of, quote, unquote, decide on this hybrid model. Right? What does that look like? Who does that impact? What do we do about teachers, personnel? We need to figure out from the community who, what families are planning on sending their kids to school. So we'll have an idea of, of how many students are returning, how many actually are going to stay home and do full time virtual. Right? Again, that will impact uh, personnel and um, the time it's going to take for teachers to um, get their lessons um, and sort of their teaching structure in order. I think there are so many moving parts that the moment we make a decision that then impacts five or six more decisions that we then have to figure out that then don't have downstream again, right? I think while I understand we're going to have a rocky start, whether it is August 24th or September 1st, the less rockier the better, even though I know it's going to be a rocky start. We haven't done this before. Um, so I'm actually... I'm, I'm pretty supportive of starting September 1. I actually still think that's a little early, but that's just me. Um, so that's that's where I just see the September 1 date being ideal. Um, that's how I'm looking at this. The other thing that I just want to mention, too, is just building, getting buildings ready. Yeah. Um, the middle school and high school, the summer cleaning was divided into two crews. The middle and high schools are just about finished. And the two crews will go to boys and cooler. Uh, but it's rearranging of entire classrooms. Uh, and our summer crew right now 
Um, those young men will go back to college at some point. I think all of their universities are opening. Um, and we'll be left with, you know, four or five maintenance guys who also are shared with the county. Um, so building prep in and of itself uh, is potentially an issue. And I'm, I'm just in favor of teachers having as much time to plan as possible and to go along with what uh, Ben Smith said, you know, the, the more time that we can give teachers to prepare themselves and to get it right and to have a good template um, for whether it's remote learning or um, a plan for students being in the classroom. Um, that's going to take a lot of time. It, it, you never have enough time when it's a regular year. And <coughs> it's going to be a different start. I will play a little bit devil's advocate. I'm certainly not a uh, medical professional, but uh, I, my wife works in Charlottesville, and um, I know what the university there and what a couple of other universities are have made the decision that the odds are we may have one sooner, but the odds are when cold weather comes is the highest probability of a second big spike. So they are moving everything up a month so that by the time Thanksgiving done comes, they're done to avoid that potential. And to that end, I think we can ask families to do um, to make all these plans, but if that spike comes, I think a lot of families are going to, and we may close to say, we got to close down to some extent. So I think it, we could we could plan for all this, and it could change, you know. And a family may elect, hey, I know I said I was coming back to school, but you're not, and if you're you know, once again, I'm, I'm not uh, an epidemiologist, but uh, I think we've got to plan, but there's a very high likelihood that whatever we plan may not fit what comes. I mean, that's the thing. We're planning, we're planning for a very un... Yes. For an unknown in, but, in all accounts, right? We don't know about a spike. We don't know... We should start sooner. We don't know if, you know, how much. Well, we know teachers need lots of time to plan, but there's so many unknowns, and it's, yeah. like it's moving target that we are trying to hit. That just needs and this is probably not a one-year plan. This, this is, is probably a multi-year thing. Yeah. So uh, I can't criticize the plans. I think they're I think they're great, but they're they're so huge and there's so many moving parts. It's hard for me to even. Um, consider them right now, but uh, but I appreciate the work that's been done toward towards that. It that's what makes this very difficult. It's a it's a planning dilemma. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and the other thing that I haven't even mentioned is on the health and safety side is things like contact tracing. You know, if we have a substitute teacher or a teacher or somebody in a building that has a confirmed case. We're small. And the likelihood of, I'll call it cross contamination, potentially exists because if it's a middle school and my daughter is exposed at the middle school and then goes home and then I'm there, and my wife's there, a high school student is there. Potentially, we are then exposed and don't know it and then go out to other buildings. So it's the contact tracing piece too that we have to be prepared for. And, you know, the CDC guidelines are fairly clear on school closures, although I don't think it's long enough based on what we have been told about the virus itself, is they say, well, you know, you might have to do school closures for two to five days. Well, if we believe that it potentially incubates for 14 days, then two to five is not long enough. Um, so I think the likelihood of a local closure or a mandated regional closure or a statewide closure is on the horizon. I mean, I would not be at all surprised. And that's the other thing we have to plan for. As yep. soon as we close, 
we still teach the next And day. we have to pivot fast. They told us there would be no two-week period to get ready. The expectation is if you have to close, then you will immediately pivot to, all, to remote learning. So, um, I don't know if that all meant that we could start earlier or later, but it's <laughs> great. Uh, um, I, I think, in my mind, it still, it still pushes earlier. But um, the other thing I, I was going to bring up was the, the thought that it might be helpful to have a reopening uh, subcommittee, but I think logistically and time-wise, that's probably uh, maybe unrealistic for you know, everything that needs to be done for, for the school year. So I, I would suggest, um, you know, a, 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 a meeting of the, the special meetings, um, you know, with, uh, with more frequency uh, than, you know, perhaps meeting in one month if we had two weeks if we, you know, kept on it because this is, uh, this is a big deal. So uh, I'll just put that out as a, as a way of, you know, trying to not be the, you know, a, 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 a time uh, issue, timing issue. I have just two questions or two other thoughts. Um, can we plan on having some sort of training for students and parents on this is what you do on the days that you're home and this is where you find the assignments and I think we need that as parents um, and also kids. And, you know, I'm sure you, you understand too as a parent that um, that would be helpful to how to walk through the assignments, submit them, that sort of thing. Um, and then the other question that I have is um, are we sure that we're supporting teachers enough with programs for the days that they? are doing remote learning. Um, so I think that they're, over the course of the spring, um, I think there was, it was kind of some frustration maybe with some parents and teachers asking for support for teachers pay teachers or, um, and so I just wanna make sure that we're providing them with the materials that they need. And I don't, I am not faulting anyone for that. I think that, you know, when you're asked to completely change your way of teaching and you're not in a classroom, I don't, I don't know what I would do. So I just want to make sure that, that they have the resources that they need. I became aware of that by accident. So we have three teachers who had requested support um, because they didn't have the resources they needed. And this is this is my I'll, I have two responses to that. One is they never asked, and secondly, is that we have rarely turned down any teacher for a legitimate request for any material or supply that, like, that they needed in the six years I've been here. So I, again, I don't begrudge anybody. I don't. I it's don't nobody's care. fault. But you know, we we have to commit to doing certain things. And whether it's replacing a water fountain or buying the teacher's resources that they need. Um, but if you look on the teacher survey when they were asked about the resources they use, it's huge. Uh, from Flipgrid to Screencastify to Remind, I mean, there's all kinds of things that they use uh, as part of their remote learning. Um, but no, we'll, we'll get people what they need. We just have to know. And they need to ask. They need to ask. And I think using the Education Foundation also as a resource. I know that you know an ELL teacher has already asked for the RAS Kids program, um, which differentiates reading Correct. for elementary school. Yeah, we have. Uh, they, she's already. Beth has already awarded. That the, the orders have been made on the classroom grants, mm -hmm. and items have been delivered if she's been able to deliver. So uh, they've been a great resource also. And then one other instructional assistance. If we're looking at, um, you know, lengthening the time for planning for teachers, can we also look at? We're going to need time for instructional assistants to receive the training for however their job may look. Mm -hmm. 
Right. And they're, they're contracted for 183 days. So the way we handle anything above that contract is to pay them on a per diem or an hourly basis. So when we bring those folks in, if we can't do the training within their contract, we would do it separate and pay them extra to do that. Um, that's never been an issue. We've always tried to make that work. Rick's managed that very well. And, and uh, the two of us work together to make sure we're treating people fairly. Ms. Ryan, do you have any other questions? I do. Um, I have some actual, some, a couple of questions about um, using our, our capital funds on any, um, do we have any building modifications that we are considering or could or would want to do um, as far as making, having more windows that open um, in our classrooms for fresh air, um, having any kind of um, set up for outdoor classes to be held for some students, um, as it seems that outdoor is significantly safer than indoors. And do we have to do any work on our HVAC systems to reroute the, the air and, um, and make that safer for students in the building? So buildings now are designed for windows not to be operable. And the engineers that you talk with that put the HVAC systems in will tell you that fresh air is pulled for through outside air dampers. So just like in this building that's only now been, and we've been using it about three years now, uh, three years I think this coming September, the windows don't operate. And it's because of the HVA system and the new technologies and bringing in outside air. Joey Brathwaite has been working with our uh, contracted HVAC company that we have on contract as a county, not just the schools, to conduct uh, duct cleaning and a variety of other preventative maintenance and, and maintenance kinds of items on our HVAC systems. Um, we have had, as you can imagine, uh, a ton of vendors reach out to us that want to sell us I probably get 25 to 30 emails a day from people who have changed their focus on some widget that they were making to something now that's related to COVID-19. And that's probably not an exaggeration, 25 to 30. Um, so all of that work has been handled through Joey's office. Uh, are there modifications we could make to Windows? Any modification that was made would, would somehow impact the way the HVA system operates. Um, as far as outside uh, learning environments, uh, you know, that's always an option, um, obviously when appropriate. Uh, there is space in, at all schools to be able to do some outside kinds of things during the course of the year. And we can't unload a building uh, in, in every case and have space for everybody. Um, but certainly they could use outside if they chose, or even for lunch, you could go outside and eat lunch on days when it wasn't, you know, we didn't have anything in the web. Uh, so we'll be creative. Uh, so on the HVAC question, um, are there health department guidelines or CDC guidelines related to making sure that the system that we have in place is, is safe and not, um, and constantly renewing the, the fresh air from outside and then not recirculating. Those guidelines are set not by the CDC that I'm aware of, but by other agencies. So when those systems are designed, they meet the criteria at that time. And if that criteria would change, then obviously, you know, the system would need an overhaul or adjusted. But Joey can actually see from his office in most buildings through a computer program how much the outside air makeup is. He uses the recommended guidelines from, from the EPA and others who regulate that kind of thing. Uh, so he can actually see that from the computer in his office uh, and make adjustments as needed. You can low rate, uh, you can open or close the outside air damper more. Uh, sometimes when you go into a building and it's kind of humid, the outside air damper needs to be adjusted because the weather outside is humid and it draws in that outside moisture. 
Um, so all of that's handled through uh, a computer program that regulates that stuff. He can even set the temperature in the building from, his, from a computer. Okay, I know it probably sounds like a crazy line of questioning, but um, you know when you read about the predicted fall spike, a lot of that is due to people being indoors without fresh air circulating. So that's that's why I'm asking them the questions. And I don't know if our vendor has you know recommendations for any kind of modifications or or, or rerouting. Uh, Oh, yeah. uh, it's a good point. I, I would encourage to you know, jack up the pressure intake as, as much as the, the limits go out. Very straightforward. And then to really encourage them um, to be outside and, you know, for their classes as much as possible. Um, you know, I know that we have, um, you know, outdoor lawn spaces, but there's also Tehover Park and um, essentially the fairgrounds where there are covered pavilion spaces with, you know, I don't know if we can ask those, those um, organizations to use those, but um, I think as much as we can have our kids out and, and staff members outside, um, it just seems to be such a safer um, place for them to be. So with the um, high school class that's like essentially a teacher cadet program, is there a way that we could look at um, partnering some of those high school students with our elementary school children, potentially at the Cooley upper campus, um, you know, for um, remediation or extension activities also? Um, we're working with um, some of the gap groups that we're concerned about. Yeah, uh, Ms. Waring actually brought that up uh, in a conversation I had with her a week or so, maybe 10 days ago. And she was not from that point specifically, but perhaps even with like child care. Mm -hmm. Right. And being able right. to work with students one on one. Uh, each of those students that went through that program this past year until our closure actually had a little uh, classroom placement that they were working mm -hmm. on the teacher. So I think there's some possible, maybe we can use right. those students right. to provide remediation or some child care or that's one of the options that, that Ms. Waring actually mentioned. Right. And I know that the high school students, if they're not in class, they, you know, they should be essentially doing their remote learning, um, but it might be a, a good way for our community to use the resources that we have and meet one another for child care or, um, of the public school. Yeah, so on top of that, National Honor Society, right? You need volunteer hours. So maybe some of those students might be willing to help kids who are learning virtually with some of the Oh, that's a really good point. Um, we've talked about internet access, um, and we know there are plenty of families in the county that have. Um, don't have access to internet. So I think there's been talks with the Board of Supervisors, right? Like we, are we trying to work and come up with? Well, they had, the uh, Board of Supervisors had a uh, technology committee uh, that they were working and one of the things that they were working on was uh, increasing broadband connectivity within the county. To be honest, I'm not sure where that stands at this point, um, but you know, that's not something that's gonna happen tomorrow. And I think that this issue with school closures across the country has brought to look to light really a lot of things but one of those is the lack of reliable high-speed connectivity in many communities uh, and to, in my opinion it's kind of like electricity i mean it, it's one of those things that's almost essential uh, to, to use in your uh, or to have in your home so but yeah i'm not sure the Board of Supervisors does have a special broadband committee, and we um, they're actively looking for ways to partner with the state for grants. That was um, 
by closing one of the regions and accomplishments. And they're also working on, we're going to add, I believe we're going to add two um, citizen members to it. One, maybe one. But anyway, that, can, that committee does exist and it's continued working to make it a better committee. Um, the board, who was here earlier this evening, is on that. So, okay. Just FYI. Okay. Thank Thanks. you. I mean, it's always been a topic, right? But I think right now it's probably high on the list of. It, it, it's, and every, any discussion I've been, they go all yeah. out. Every, every county, every locality brought the input to the governor will come um, out find more money. Right. Okay. Thanks. Um, okay. I have so many thoughts and so many things, but um, anything else? Is it. I feel like we can capture more of the conversation here during this meeting. Do we, is there anything else we want to add to Chuck's items of things to consider from us? Um, I know this will be an ongoing, ever evolving conversation all the time. Um, but like I said, we're not making any um, motions or approving anything formally, but you can see this is the direction in which. Um, we seem to be headed as a division, and so. Yeah, I think following up with Chuck, between now and the next meeting, I mean, something may come. I'm not going to think of anything new in the fourth hour of the meeting, I don't think. You don't, you don't have so much to say about that. Um, okay. Ms. Ryan? No. Are you sure? Yeah. I can ask individual questions as they come to my mind. I think I'm good for tonight. Okay. Um, Mr. Tripkow? I, I, I think the direction is generally what we should be heading. Okay. Ms. Schellower, I do not have anything else. <clears throat> okay. Um, so I'll just uh, just say obviously there's a there's a lot to consider when it comes to um, what we need to do to protect our teachers, um, the health of our teachers. There's a lot for us to do when we talk about bringing in these students and making sure they are safe and healthy. And then um, on the flip side of this very big coin, we also, our main priority is educating um, all these students. So there's a, there's a lot to do here, so appreciate everything you're doing, all the time you're putting into this, going into classrooms on a Sunday at 10 o'clock, um, 10 o'clock at night, talk to your wife about that. Um, so it sounds like we, the direction you're headed, the way to go. Um, I do think we'll probably move up the July meeting, but I'll talk to everybody to see what works with their schedule. And I do think we may have to meet a little more regularly or more frequently, if needed. Let me know sooner rather than later. I don't know if you want to talk about that further tonight, or you just let me know. Do um, we definitely want to move our July meeting? Can I, can I just talk about that quickly? Move it. Uh, Closure. I'm going to be okay. out here. Yeah. Well, I'm going to be going the last week of July. But I should be here before then. So the 13th. Our meeting would otherwise be um, the 20th. Oh, 27th. Oh, sorry, 27th. I, I suggested the 13th. I mean, the first Monday is the 6th. So you're going to the 6th? We'll have, we'll have graphs ready. I mean, I can change the the timeline just a little bit for my folks, but we'll have, we'll be ready. Okay. Yes. Final thing. Yes. Sure. Okay. Okay. Do we want to call it a working session? I would not just call it a regular board meeting if you want to make type of action. There's no such the action specifically in a work session. You'll have drafts ready for us. Yes. And to have action. That's the plan. Okay. I'd like to allow you an opportunity to have feedback 
to provide feedback. I mean, the draft plans you'll have an opportunity to review several days ahead of time. Um, and you might have suggestions and things that we need to change. So you might take action on the 6th or you might not. You might kick it back to us and then want us to come back on the 13th or some other day. Um, so, but that'll be, we'll have to figure that out when we get there. Yeah, and if you need a work session prior to that, then you know, in the next two weeks, we can do that too. Or do you want to call the six the work session and just talk through the plans and you guys give us feedback? Well, I guess I'm worried it's the 15th today, right? So Correct. do you think you're, when do you think you're going to be able to give us stuff to review? I, I need to, to uh, the sixth would be the soonest. I mean, basically it's. But would you be giving it to us on, I mean, and we're also looking at the 4th of July holiday, right? right. So you get and it. you're also. We post the Friday just like we do for a typical meeting. Although Friday is a holiday in this office, but uh, we'll get a post. I'll get a post. I won't wait for an Okay, so I mean, as long as you feel comfortable getting us the info, it seems like a big stretch. I, I think so. I think I think like it's more of a work session. session. Okay, let's do the sixth as a work session. And if you decide in the next week it can be changed, okay. we can still do that, All right. right? Yeah, let me touch base with everybody, but let's let's pencil in the sixth right now, and then I'll be in touch with you if we need to make it the thirteenth. Okay. I mean, I know people want answers and they want to know what the plan is. So the sooner the better. But I want to do we we want to do collectively do a good job of putting these plans together. Yeah. So I would rather take a little more time to do a thorough job, right, and then to answer questions quickly. Sure. Um, so, okay, so we're looking at six and 13, so just, just like, okay. Um, okay, I'm just trying to back, I forgot, so that's good. Um, all right, any, anything else? Okay, we need to talk about the return to athletics. Yeah, so last Thursday, the Virginia High School League, uh, as I mentioned earlier, announced that they were going to reopen. Um, have a season practice. Um, we have um, revised this document or developed the document, revised it um, to look at three phases. Uh, I have spoken with uh, our athletic director at the high school and we would enter phase one on June 29th. So the way this will work, and obviously this is a seven page document that gets down to specific sports and what are high risk sports versus those that aren't, or what are high risk activities versus those that, that aren't as high risk. And at the end of the day, each coach will have to take this guidance document and develop an individual plan for their sport because football is different than basketball and is different than weightlifting is different than cross country. Um, my guess is that you will see sports like cross country and golf be uh, opened up by the Virginia High School League more quickly than a sport like football for obvious reasons. So each coach would have to take the guidelines and develop their plan of how they're gonna work with their athletes by phase. In talking with Mr. Childs, we would look to open phase one on June 29th. So two weeks from tonight, that would give us an opportunity to have coaches meetings. It would give us an opportunity to allow coaches to develop their plans for those plans to be submitted to the athletic director, to the principal. And then the final approval would have to be through Mr. Kaplan and myself. Uh, no coach could do anything until everybody had reviewed it and signed off on it uh, with these specific guidelines in place. So from facilities cleaning to how students enter and exit the facility, um, the limit sizes for phase one specifically, no more than 10 people uh, in an isolated area. Um, we would look to develop pods of students. So you might have, as, as an example in football, if you've had kids lifting weights, you might say that the running backs are going to lift on Monday at 10 o'clock in the morning. So there's five or, five or six kids that would be in that pod. So you limit the interaction among teammates <clears throat> to just those kids that are in that pod. Indoor and outdoor activities are handled differently. Um, 
uh, to Ms. Ryan's point, fresh air uh, seems to be something that's a mitigating strategy. Uh, so we would look to uh, handle indoor activities and outdoor act activities differently. Uh, every, every student and every coach would have health screenings done. That's an infrared thermometer. And then you saw the checklist at the very end of the document where they would answer just a few questions uh, about their exposure uh, to illness. Face coverings. Uh, most of or this, this, this guidance comes from the Virginia High School League and their Sports Medicine Committee. Uh, and also is in alignment with CDC as well as the, the state document that was provided last week. Uh, hygiene practices, hydration, no water bottle sharing, every student has their own water bottle, no travel at all during phase one. So all activities would be limited to our campus. Um, locker rooms and training areas, locker rooms would be off limits. Uh, and then training areas uh, would be utilized for students who are, uh, unless the athletic trainer is present. Uh, there are restrictions there for weight lifting. Um, equipment would have to be wiped down between student use. Um, resistance training should be emphasized as body weight, weight machines, et cetera, limiting the use of like dumbbells and free weights that, that uh, multiple people would be using. It's easier to wipe down equipment than it is uh, a dumbbell, uh, physical activity and athletic equipment, uh, same kind of thing, no sharing of towels or um, other kinds of equipment. Uh, if a basketball uh, session was held, every student had to have an individual ball of their own. Uh, there would be no sharing of that ball. They could work on individual skills, uh, but would not do anything like team scrimmaging against the size of the group would be limited. Uh, you might bring in all ninth grade boys or ninth grade girls, uh, guards or forwards or centers, but everything would be done up top. We are looking to have phase one last for approximately a week to see how it goes and extend it if we need to. Uh, I have made it abundantly clear uh, that we do not anticipate anybody stepping outside of these boundaries. And if they do, then we will shut down out of season practice or out of season training. Uh, that everybody has to take this seriously. Um, also, for, <coughs> for activities like marching band, uh, these same rules would apply. And marching band is actually seen in this document and information that we receive uh, from, from different agencies. Uh, as a high risk activity because of, as you blow on your instrument, the, the potential for droplets to be expelled uh, and be uh, breathed in by another individual. Uh, had some communication with Mr. Curry and he is not ready at this point to have uh, band students back in for any kind of uh, work. So this would primarily be uh, athletics, um, but it's pretty well detailed. Any questions? I have two. Um, so in phase one, does that mean you are starting with um, that group of lower risk sports? Yes. Yeah. And then you don't add the moderate risk sports until later phases? That's correct. So like football specific workouts, like with a ball out on the field is a high risk activity. But weightlifting could be done in a lower risk environment. You know, okay. if equipment's wiped down, et cetera. So that doesn't mean our football players won't be lifting weights. They just won't be participating in football specific kinds of team activities or drills. Okay. Uh, so phase one, we would uh, look at those low risk activities, cross country, golf, weight training uh, would be lower risk. Okay. And, and would there be, um, would there be a possibility of um, if those more, more high risk activities cannot take place, we don't get there. 
um, can we expand the availability of the or the size of the teams um, to, uh, for the lower risk activities like cross country golf? Can we expand them down to lower grades or um, more open them up to more students? Uh, lower grades would be like middle and high school, like cross country as an example, uh, would be available to any student in grade nine to 12. Uh, to my knowledge, we've never, and I've never been associated with a school that said we only take 10 cross country runners. Uh, usually uh, they'll take as many kids who want to participate. Uh, now, the number of kids who run on a meet and score is, is different, just like in golf. The number of students who would actually be able to participate in the matches or the golf meets would be limited. Okay. Uh, but the size of the team is often just uh, um, determined by the number of kids who are interested. Okay, that's great. Yeah. Middle school also has cross country in the fall. <clears throat> uh, so we would have a group of students there as well uh, later on uh, that might want to participate. Okay. Um, my other question is um, during the school year, if, uh, if a student is primarily being uh, um, taught remotely, will they be allowed to participate in athletics? If they're enrolled in Clark County Schools, yes. Okay. But they have to meet all the criteria of the Virginia High School League, that of progress, a student in good standing, that's what we always refer to it as. They would have to pass a certain number of courses. Um, they would have to, attendance would have, they couldn't just show up once a week. Attendance has to be um, maintained. So yes, if they're enrolled in the school system, whether remote or in person, if they're meeting the criteria of a student in good standing with the Virginia High School League, they would be eligible. Okay, thanks. Any other questions? We have a motion. I move to approve the CCPS Return to Athletics Activity Summer Guidance Plan as presented. Second. Um, any discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. All opposed? have a September 1st start date, then Dr. Bishop should present to us a draft revised calendar for 2021. Great. Yeah, so we should definitely have that. That one session. Um, okay, school board member, school board member comments, um, Mr. Shee? Um, um, uh, just a standard body amount of work that's been done in prep. And I don't think I need to see any more. You're uh, four plus hours in. Ms. Ryan. Um, I've said a lot tonight, so I'll just say thank you for all the work that um, all of the staff has done over the last few very strange months. And um, thank you in advance for all of the heavy lifting that's going to be done over the next few months. Yeah, and I think all that why. I mean, this is just, you know, no one signed up because they thought it was an easy job, and time certainly make it that much more challenging. So, appreciate the perseverance. I had a lot right now, but I, I just, I'm just going to cut it short. Um, I think that it's important to recognize, for our community to recognize that we're a small community and we don't have multiple um, staff members or lots of different departments. And so we're asking building level administrators as well as administrators uh, within this building to complete multiple tasks um, with not as many, but not as, for the lack of resources um, in comparison to some of our neighboring counties. And I think that it's important to be mindful of that. And um, instead of, placing blame or criticizing um, the school system. I think it's an important time for our community to come together um, to 
create or to have creative solutions to problems that, that we see, um, particularly in the area of child care. Um, I think that, and I think that those creative solutions by community members should be encouraged. Um, and I think that we're all receptive to that as work. Um, and then lastly, this is completely changing gears, but I want to thank Dr. Bishop for releasing a statement on June 6th in regards to denouncing racism within our, our school community. Um, and I'm happy and grateful that we're going to reestablish the Equity and Diversity Committee for our own schools. Um, and I've already had a number of community members ask um, to participate on the, on the committee. Um, I think that there's excitement in regards to that, and I hope that um, there will be an opportunity for interested students as well. Just looking at the Winchester Star article today, I saw that, you know, maybe it was in my days are all mixed up, but I saw that there were high school students who spoke on Saturday. So I think that involving um, as many people as we can in that conversation is important. And then in light of celebrating diversity and equity and um, incorporating inclusiveness in our division, I'd like to ask again that we uh, formally recognize Paul Jones. Um, his death was about a year ago um, at the end of May in 2019. And he devoted more than half of his life to our school system, um, serving as an administrator at Boyce, um, the primary school, as well as D.G. Cooley. And I think just the fact that he um, served as a role model and a source of inspiration to the Black children in our community is important. And um, the fact that he also was a graduate of um, Jonathan Williams School, which was the Black High School, um, is also significant. Um, so I hope that, I, I don't know if that's something for the diversity community or committee to address, or if it's something that the building, you know, the administration would rather address. Um, but I, I would like to see that happen. I think it's important um, to recognize the impact that he's had on our community. Okay, um, so I will just say, um, as Smith talked about graduation, um, I thought, it, it, considering um, everything, I thought it was great. Um, I know I watched a couple on Facebook Live and I was very excited and got pretty emotional. And I thought that even though I missed those cowbells so much, <laughs> um, Trying to think of the silver lining, I thought for the families who participated and the ones that I spoke to, the intimacy behind this graduation, um, I think made it so special. And I know we love the hubbub and we love all the cheering and the yelling and the celebrating, but I think, I don't know, I found with the families this go around that celebrating in this intimate way just brought a new um, level of appreciation for this for this pretty big milestone. Um, so thanks to you and um, Ms. Warren for making it happen. I thought it was pretty amazing. Um, I also liked seeing the online res res uh, resignations, the online recognitions and the videos that were done. I thought that was great. Again, everybody's doing the best that we can. So um, I thought that was a really great way to recognize um, students. And then obviously with everything going on, I know there's been a lot of chatter on social media. I know the community's concerned. I know families are concerned. We have a lot of um, things to consider when it comes to teaching our students as well as trying to make, um, trying to allow our parents to go out and work during this, these really difficult times. Um, so what I'm hearing is we need to think about child care. I don't know what that looks like. We need to think about um, allowing parents to have, be able to go to work without thinking of these crazy schedules. There's this really big balancing act um, for everybody. So I would just ask everybody to be patient. We're doing the best that we can. I know Dr. Bishop and his staff, they're doing the best that they can. We're, we and by me, I'm saying, 
Dr. Bishop is making really tough decisions um, and these aren't easy. And we know whatever decision is going to be made, no one's going to be happy with, and we don't know what the impact will be down the road. Um, so I would just ask everybody to be patient. Let's work together. We're not going to make everybody happy, so we can say that running out the gate. We know September 1 probably won't be the smoothest first day, but that's okay too. Um, so I'm just asking for flexibility. I know um, as a board, I think we will operate in that manner. We always have. And um, we'll do our best to take care of all the students and all community members, not even just part of the school, not even the community members that are just part of the school system, but as part of the whole. This is about the health and safety of everybody in the town, I mean, in the, in the county. Um, and so while I know there are differences of opinions of how, um, how COVID is and how it isn't, who it impacts and who it doesn't, nonetheless. It is still a priority of ours to make sure everybody stays healthy and that we educate the students as best we can in the world in which we are living at this moment. So, so if I could just close and thank Gordon Russell. Gordon's been with us uh, all evening tonight. He's uh, the IT guru at the county level, and under short notice, he put this YouTube live. A presentation or, or live opportunity together because we knew that we would be limited with the number of people who could be here this evening because of size restrictions and the number of seats in this room. And we knew that there was some significant and considerable interest in this topic about next year. So thank you, Gordon. Thank you for being here. Thank you for doing it on short notice. Gordon joked with me today, everything he does is on short notice. So, <laughs> uh, he's given a, a lot of tasks and, and uh, does them all incredibly well and works very closely with our IT guys here in the school system to make sure that it's as seamless as it can be across the county for all of those who are affected. So, uh, and this will actually end the recorded or the live presentation or the live YouTube uh, feed for this evening. The board will go into closed session shortly. And uh, again, so this will end the live uh, feed at this point. Thanks, Gordon. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, may I have a motion? Okay, I move to convene a closed session to discuss personnel matters, including appointments and resignation pursuant to Code of Virginia 2.2 3711A1, the estimated.